Hello all, my name is Nadja and um, it will be my pleasure to guide you through our very first international meetup tonight. Uh, in the name of the whole Quantux team, I just want to uh, thank you for your great interest in this event. Uh, we have around uh, 100 people uh, here with us, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so I hope that uh, you will find presentations uh, interesting, uh, useful, and that you will be able to implement some of the tips into your day-to-day -day job. So first on the stage tonight is Ivan Stefkovsky. Uh, he will share his view of um, modern front-end technologies. Uh, he, uh, Ivan is uh, from our Macedonian office and uh, he is of course a front-end developer who is uh, young by age, not by experience. So just to note that um, after each presentation uh, we will have a 10 minutes Q&A session so you will be um, able to ask us uh, any questions. You can do that during uh, the presentations uh, through the chat, which is on the right side. So, um, Ivan, it's your turn. Only 100 people are listening to you, too, so just without pressure. Um, enjoy and see you at the first break. Bye. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ivan Stepkovsky. I'm 24 years old and I've been a front-end developer for about four years. I've had an interest in programming and development from an early age and from there on, I've always carried that with me and seen it through. I was fortunate enough to start my career on big and rather interesting projects with wonderful coworkers and mentors from whom I've learned a lot. Today is a new milestone for me and my company. And so with that, I'd like to welcome you to our first ever international web development meetup. I will be talking about front-end development featuring React. So uh, during the last few years, we've seen a lot of advancements in web development in general that have helped shape the internet we know and use today. One place, uh, one place there's been a difference is front-end development, where new frameworks were introduced and came into play, a topic I'd like to tell you more about. Front-end development can also be referred to as client-side development. It's the practice of producing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript but more importantly, it's what the end user sees and interacts with. The way how I visualize front-end uh, front development is much like the primary colors. You can use them to get any, any other color of the rainbow. Much like the colors, the basics of and core of front-end development are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. No matter what tools you use and develop with, as long as it's front-end development, the end result will always be, uh, will always be uh, these three, these three uh, languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. However, we've come a long way and developed what is now known as the modern front-end development. And uh, that's what I've referred to as the big F. You might recognize some of these uh, logos, which is Angular, React, and Vue. Uh, so those are the most popular frameworks and the ones you're most likely uh, to use. The one we will be focusing on today is React. React is a JavaScript library uh, for building fast, modern, and easily maintainable user interfaces. One of the key benefactors is that it's built around the idea of content-based UI. Taking in consideration the ease of learning this library and the results it can produce makes it one of the most desirable amongst beginners and developers. React uses JSX for templating, which is an HTML-like syntax, uh, to uh, which is a uh, HTML uh, like syntax, which is quite easy to use. Um, building with uh, JSX uh, uses a virtual DOM where the representation of the UI is kept in memory and always available to sync in instantly on demand, giving the speed it's known for. Uh, depending on when you've come to familiarize with React, you may have noticed some substantial differences from the early beginning and the recent present. One that has made a bigger impact was the introduction of, uh, to hooks but more on that topic in the upcoming sessions. Right now, we'll talk about components. So components are independent reusable fragments of code that essentially return JSX, uh, which at the end of the funnel gets parsed inside the DOM, uh, where, uh, where they represent uh, part of the user interface. There are two types of components, and those are the functional and class components. 
we will be taking a look at uh, a really simple example of uh, functional and class components. And um, this is the same, uh, this uh, essentially does the same job. And we can see that there's only a small difference and that's the render method. Uh, however, while functional components, uh, so basically what a, a class component uh, does is a class component is uh, usually a higher order component that has uh, that can manage and uh, that can manage their own state, as well as well as their own life cycle. So they process all the data that's fed to them and use that information to render the desired view. Now we mentioned their life cycle. What this essentially means is that they can handle and alter data during the whole process from start to finish, um, uh, or during its lifespan. Now, uh, functional components are much simpler than that. So they serve uh, one purpose, and that's returning JSX. They are JavaScript functions that can accept properties as an argument, or commonly known as props. Uh, they process the data received and return a JSX code. However, they do not use the render method. They only return. So we will take a look at of, uh, how, how more complex a class component can get. So basically, we have a class component called mouse tracker. So essentially, what uh, this does is what the same thing the name tells you. It tracks the mouse. And basically, the, the class component can take, uh, as you can see, can uh, record the state. Um, so basically, you have an on, on mouse move, uh, sorry, <laughs> event uh, listener, uh, which calls every, which is uh, triggered every time the mouse is moved. When the mouse is moved, uh, Yes, uh, when the mouse is moved, it calls the handle mouse move uh, function, which then sets the state with the new coordinates of the mouse. Moving on to hooks. So actually, before we move on to hooks, I'd like to mention one more part, because I think some people might uh, ask it as a question later on. So um, the way you would determine up to the up to the point before we introduce hooks, the way you would determine what type of a component to use uh, is if the component needs and uh, needs to have and manage their own state. But with the introduction of hooks, that all changes. So as we uh, as we already concluded from the early beginning of React, uh, which is now commonly known as more commonly known as legacy React, the components used to divide between functional and class component. And right now we can all we can uh, merge all the uh, everything into one component using uh, into one functional component using hooks. So hooks bring us the ability to use state con uh, controlled yet simplified component lifecycle and other React uh, features without the difficulty of managing a state. Welcome to modern React. Um, we successfully eliminated all the confusion beginners had to face, giving them a more functional programming paradigm, or in other words, that you may find more appealing to the ear, uh, it's easier. <laughs> so we will take a look at the example uh, on the presentation. And this is a simple, uh, simple React component where we've set we, we're, uh, a functional component where we have the state. So as we can see, we have a state for count and we have the set count. On the, uh, on the onclick event listener, when it's triggered, we simply set the count to plus one from what it was before. And then the component gets updated. So naming a, a bit more of uh, hooks, we can see that we have the use state that we just saw, which replaces the, st the state from class components. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about only a few that are more commonly used. You can feel free to ask more uh, in the questions. Use state is used for creating and managing the component state, um, whereas use effect is used for managing the component lifecycle, and use ref is uh, returns an object with a current property set to the value passed to the hook. It's important because the value exists outside the component render lifecycle, so the value is persistent throughout the whole uh, the whole lifespan of the of the component. Moving on, we have class and hooks comparison. Um, we have a class component, um, and we will compare it with the we will compare it with a functional component. So on the left side, 
uh, we have the class component where we approach its life cycle through the component did mount and component did update methods. Basically, when the component is called, we tap into the life cycle, starting off with the component did mount. So this happens when whenever a component is called into, into the screen or into the play, whatever, however you want to uh, say it. Uh, the first thing that gets called is the component did mount. So at that point, you know that the component is mounted, but it's not rendered yet. So you can alter uh, some data like we did on the screen. We set the title. If um, on uh, we have also on a button uh, a button with an on-click event. So when the on-click event is called, triggered, uh, we set the, the state. Whenever the set is um, whenever the set uh, the state is changed, the component did update gets called, and then we up and that's how we update the state. So. Um, yeah, uh, this is how we used to do it uh, in the older ways. And now in the more modern ways with hooks, we approach it a, a bit differently. And that's using the use state and use effect hooks. And that's on the right screen. Um, so you can see uh, that uh, we we have a, uh, a state for count. Uh, and it's, it's the same, it's, uh, it, it works on the same principles. However, there's a small difference, and that's we don't we do not have component did mount and component did admin, uh, update. Those are change those are uh, changed or replaced by use effect. Now use effect can have uh, true it can function in two ways in order to to get all the functionality of the class component. And here I've written uh, just a little bit uh, for ex just a little explanation on on what the three ways of setting a use effect are. So you can set it with an empty dependency tree, which means the component uh, use effect gets called only when the component is mounted and only once. You can add a dependency, and that's the, that's a variable that a use effect will follow and track. So when temp updates, use effect gets called. So that's essentially component did update. And we can call it without any dependency, which um, which means that the component the, this code here that you would uh, this code uh, on the on the last uh, use effect would get called on any update of the component. We'll move on to CSS in JS just on, after I take a sip of water. <laughs> right, so CSS in JS. So. Um, Modern front-end development means that uh, means means being able to have a more dynamic approach to CSS as well. So not only just uh, do we want to simplify the way we we write our application, we want to have a more than a, a more flexible and dynamic uh, CSS. So this is being uh, this is best achieved through, through style components uh, through style components, and this is a library. And what it does it is it removes the mapping between component and styles. So you do not need to create a separate CSS file because what you essentially do is define your styles inside the component, therefore creating a normal React component that has your styles attached to it. And we can see that in an example on the presentation. So if you take a look, you'll notice that uh, we're able to change the styles based on props and data of the application, uh, meaning we have a button, uh, we, have, uh, we have a button component and we're able to uh, we're, we we're able to have different styles depending on the properties it receives. So the normal button gets rendered with the normal styles, and when we pass the uh, when we pass the primary prop, uh, we can see that we check and then change some of the features, uh, some of the uh, of the CSS uh, properties, ending up giving us a totally different button. Button. Right. Um, so. Essentially, um, yeah, um, just a second. So I'm going to give you a, a bit of an example for this. That's going to be maybe, maybe make, maybe explain it a bit better on, on how you could use it. So picture creating a, a layout grid using display grid. So right now, uh, if you write in CSS, you would have to define an exact number of, of uh, rows and columns. While uh, with uh, CSS in JS, or with, or uh, better yet, with style components, you'd be able to solve it. Uh, you'll be able to solve one of the bigger issues, and that's uh, 
having it change, having the rows and columns change based on our arrival. So you can uh, you could define uh, you could dynamically define the grid rows and columns based on the number of elements it holds or it needs to hold. And uh, don't get me started on how helpful helpful it can be when it comes to uh, responsive design. You could uh, based on a variable you could uh, change a lot of things, um, meaning uh, uh, leading to a better layout and less code. Right. So next next up is React-based uh, frameworks and how to approach a project. So one of the downsides of React by itself and many other JavaScript-based frameworks is poor SEO. And SEO is good, uh, and SEO is important. <laughs> yeah, of course it's good. <laughs> right, so that's one of the bigger issues that uh, we will face with, with React, having it by its own because um, like we, men like we mentioned, React is a library used for, for the UI mostly. So that's, that's when uh, uh, React-based uh, frameworks come into play. So the, the React application approach can be, can be categorized as SPA, meaning single page application, SSG, static site generators, and SSR, server site rendering. There are two major major players when it comes to React-based frameworks, and those are Next.js, which is server-side rendering, and Gatsby.js, which is static site uh, generators generator. So you, I'll actually tell you what uh, where you've seen this or come into play with them. So single-page applications are structured and developed much like the approach you have on mobile applications. Instead of multiple HTML pages and having the browser navigate through them. Our application source code is responsible for filling, interacting, and navigating between your application content. Working bare bones like this also brings, some, brings you some trade-offs, and that's one we've already mentioned, and that's tricky SEO, something you'd likely want to avoid for your project. So how do we avoid this? We can avoid this by uh, implementing, uh, by, uh, by, having, uh, by using Gatsby or using uh, static site, uh, a static site generator. So when it comes to static site generators and what they are, so the best option to use is Gatsby.js, and which is what PayPal and Spotify are, are built upon. Uh, Gatsby uses API to, APIs to create static HTML at build time, and that's important, meaning it will produce and uh, be ready to serve static, uh, static HTML files without having, uh, without having that done at the runtime. Uh, Gatsby rendered HTML pages aim to give you the SEO and social sh sharing advantages uh, of server-side rendering as close as possible and the speed and security of, of a static site generator. So you would, uh, you would have uh, search engines finding your page much easier than you would before. Um, you'd be well, uh, well more reachable. Uh, your site will be well more, more reachable. Server-side rendering, or in this case, one of the more popular options is Next.js. Uh, and uh, you've already, I'm sure you've already heard of some of the applications. I'll name a few. And it's important, uh, the, the projects that I'm naming are important because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, help explain when uh, to use which, uh, which, um, yeah, which, which tool to use when, when. So, um, some of the applications built upon Next.js are Netflix, Hulu, and Twitch. Next.js takes the worry of building minification and hot reloading away by having tons of features just out of the box. When we talk about server-side rendering in JavaScript, we are referring to JavaScript isomorphic rendering, meaning we render the, mo uh, the, mo uh, the important parts of the application with, uh, with the read data safely kept on the server side. So when we pull the page, we just render part of it, but we have the data all on the server side. So not reachable by default. So uh, taking a moment, you may be asking now, uh, so both render the page and let the framework uh, handle the client side, client side interactions. So why should we use server side rendering or why should we use uh, static side generators? The biggest difference is that server side rendering uh, 
that with ser ser uh, server-side rendering, uh, your application, your pages are rendered at runtime for each request, allowing you to customize the, in the initial render of your page based on the user context. Whereas ser uh, static site generators generate static pages where the initial content is the same for every user. So to put that in more human words, <laughs> I'm gonna gonna revisit uh, what uh, the reason why we named some of the projects that uh, use this uh, type of uh, rendering or yeah. So by using server side, I'm gonna revisit one of the sentences that probably was a bit uh, complicated to understand. So by using server side rendering, you're able to customize and deliver a page at runtime based on the user accessing the page. Which is why you should. Uh, so this is this is the reason why I mentioned the applications. So the easiest way to understand this is that applications like, like Netflix, Hulu, and Twitch, uh, before they give you the page, they already have some of the information uh, from your site. So they can render a, a page directly, specifically with uh, customized for for your for that particular user or for you in this case. So that's um, that's the biggest difference between them. The next uh, slide is the conclusion of, of uh, all of this. So how do you choose what to use and what do you use? So there are a lot of tools and ways to approach our goal. However, it's crucial that we take a moment and determine which path, which path to take, having in mind the resources available at our disposal. Because having a server-side rendering requires more, more, uh, more server power, I'd say, and more resources. Uh, so ending at, at a bigger cost. So you might be better off uh, using a static site generator. So for instance, if you're doing su such uh, as a dashboard or some other page, you would get the speed of server side rendering and maybe even a uh, uh, more uh, improved speed than that. Right, so the next section is, uh, we're gonna go to Q and A and we can explain uh, some of the questions that I was not able to explain to you uh, during this presentation. And you can feel free to ask me anything in the chat. I'm gonna revisit some of the questions that you guys have, uh, if you've written any. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to start to start asking, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a minute to ask a few questions and revisit the chat afterwards. Okay, let's see some of the of the questions. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm reading uh, Davar's question. Is there any? Sorry, there are a lot of um, questions and it's popping up, I'm gonna slide it up a little bit. Just give me a second. Um, okay. Right. Um, sorry, the, the chat keeps going. Um, okay, is there uh, any reason to use class components after hooks introduction? Is there any case that you have seen that class components actually achieve the goal better than hooks? How do you determine if you are going to use functional or class-based components? Right. So before this, uh, before hooks, you would determine uh, based on, uh, well, basically you would uh, normally start off, you're, you're best off starting off with a functional component and then because it's really easy to convert to a class component, quite simple. Um, so you would, uh, you would uh, basically uh, start off with a functional component or you could determine uh, be even before that by, uh, by knowing if your, uh, if your um, component needs to track uh, its own, to have its own state or record any, uh, record any, any uh, state actually variables or if you need to use the lifecycle of that component. 
Um, is there any case that you've seen a class component? Well, actually, not really. You could, I, I think where you're better off using hooks, it's much simpler and um, it's much more clean. It's easier to understand easier to manage for me at least. And I think for everyone else uh, that I've, uh, you know, that I've exchanged uh, differences with. Um, sorry, give me a second. Is there any case that you've seen a class component? How do you determine if you're going to use functional class-based components? Yeah, so I believe I've answered that question uh, fully um, as far as I know. Sorry, I'm reading through some questions. Uh, I'm gonna go to, to Milos. In, is CSS in JS best way to use CSS with React? Um, I believe you can use uh, you can use both. Like uh, you you could you could use a uh, traditional CSS if you're more comfortable with, but I would suggest uh, trying out CSS in JS because then you can have the whole, the whole, um, how do you, like uh, you would have it all inside one uh, component and it would be easier to, to manage that component and you would have uh, more features. Is it better, isn't it better to have all stops? Isn't it better to have all styles in a separate CSS? Right, uh, yeah, uh, that's something that uh, I've also uh, thought about. Depends on how on how big the component is, but uh, normally you, you should be able to achieve the, the what you wanna achieve uh, with uh, having the CSS, uh, the JS, the CSS inside JS, <laughs> a bit of a tongue roll there, uh, just having uh, the CSS in JS, but yes, you could uh, essentially uh, take it outside, but I would still recommend having it inside if, if you can, so that you know you, you have a better uh, structure tree. What should be enough for a junior front-end developer internship position? Well, uh, Right, so I'm gonna assume this question is asked, uh, I'm gonna assume uh, this question is asked uh, without having a React in mind, maybe. Um, so I think uh, the you should know, like I mentioned uh, before, um, front-end, I, I see front-end the same way as, as I see the primary color. So you have CSS, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So I think uh, a good, uh, good enough would be to, to be uh, very confident in in your JavaScript skills, and in the way you in uh, uh, doing uh, dynamically uh, doing uh, CSS dynamically instead of uh, having it ha uh, hard code written or, or something like that. So, I would uh, as a junior, I would focus on the, on those fields, and after I feel that I'm uh, ready, I would then uh, focus more on uh, React since it's, uh, it would offer you uh, better positions, and um, you know it would just uh, give you uh, more options to think about. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just want to check uh, a bit of the upper questions that I may have um, skipped upon. Right, so Ilcho asked me the difference between use effect and use layout effect. And um, basically, uh, this, this can be, uh, this, I'm not sure like uh, if this, this can be a bit of a bigger answer maybe. So I'm gonna try and answer it uh, as simple as I can. So if you need to mutate the DOM or need to pref perform any, any, any type of uh, like, how do I how do I put it in more like much simpler than this? Like um, if you need to, to observe some DOM uh, DOM changes, then yeah, uh, you, you then then you would want to use uh, layout effect. But if you wanna if you don't need to interact with the DOM uh, in, uh, with the DOM, uh, and if they're uh, unobservable, then you should be using use effect. 90% uh, of the time, you would probably be using use effect. So I think just uh, focus on use effect unless you need any any 
interactive DOM changes. That's, I think, the shortest way I can answer that. Um, sorry, I'm going to revisit some questions. Sorry about that. Um, right, so let's see other questions. Well, yeah, Alexander asked uh, a, quite an interesting question, but I'm not sure how to give like a simple, simple example on, on that. Uh, you could uh, implement lazy loading inside your, your application, but maybe I think we would need a bit more time for to answer that as well. Uh, you can feel free to contact me and uh, we can uh, discuss it or something like that, but uh, maybe we can leave it uh, for another time more suitable. So I think I don't see any other questions. I think I've co covered, I think, all of your questions. And I think with that, I will leave you off to the other presenters. Give me just one second. The next presenter is Vladislav from our Ukrainian office. Vladislav has 10 years experience in software development. He is specialized in backend and very interested in uh, DevOps technologies. So, Vlad, the stage is all yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you here in our first interna international Quantox uh, meetup. Uh, my name uh, is Vlad. I'm from Quantox Kyiv office. It is located in Ukraine. And uh, I'm going to share some information with you about the API 6 tool, which we investigated uh, some time ago and we found it very interesting. Uh, hopefully, uh, you, will, you will enjoy it. Uh, let me switch off my camera so you will see the presentation in larger. We can start. So uh, I've separated my presentation on two main topics. Um, first one is a quick intro of API gateways in general. Why would they uh, were created? What features do they have? And what problems uh, we can solve with their help? And the second topic is an actual overview of API 6 and uh, its internals. Uh, I want to clarify at the beginning that um, I, I will not going to share um, the presentation in a live mode, so I will not going to send actual requests and to show you the configuration itself. Uh, just because half an hour is kind of not enough for it, so I decided to do a bit different. So in my, op in my opinion, it's better to uh, give you guys some general ideas, so kind of big picture. So if you will find this tool uh, interested for you, you can go deeper and get more get more details um, after. So uh, let's start from the a bit of theory, just for reminder. Maybe it will be something new for you. And uh, that's the basic introduction in API gateways. Um, actually, you may think about it. Um, as an orchestration tool between clients and services that you as developers provide to them. To better understand what it is, uh, let's imagine uh, that you have pretty popular now microservices architecture in your project. And uh, you may end up with some amount of fully separated services uh, that are responsible for doing some let's say, limited logic according to your business rules. So uh, let's assume that you, as a developer, um, 
designing an online shopping service where you need to build your product details page. And uh, you may end up with something like this, uh, where you can see that uh, there is a mobile client, uh, but uh, actually it may have it may be any client that you that you need, um, desktop, third party applications, whatever else. And uh, as you can see, let's imagine that you have multiple services on the backend side. Each of these services it has its own, of course, uh, very clarified and beautiful REST API. And uh, it does only one thing, like it's supposed to do in microservice architecture. So um, in this example, uh, we have a shopping cart uh, service, which gives you a number of items in your cart, shipping with all the delivery details and prices and so on. Inventory, uh, that may have the information about available amount of this product in stock. Um, recommendation service, order service, and review service you know, with customer reviews or uh, comments. So now, uh, when we have a like, raw draft of, of our service, uh, of our architecture, um, you probably need to decide in which way you are going to call your services to get the proper information. In theory, and uh, this is how it presented on the graph, uh, client could make requests to each of the microservices directly. Uh, it means that each microservice will have a public endpoint, and um, this public URL um, would map to the microservices load balancer, for example, uh, which will distribute requests across the all available instances of each particular service that you have. And um, let's assume that to get the proper product details page, you need to call all these services. So it's like seven calls from your client. And um, unfortunately, uh, this approach has some challenges and limitations. First of all is the network issue. So uh, for some of your clients, network performance might be an issue just because they may use the poor internet connection or something else so um, they may they may have problems with it another limitation is that uh, often it happens uh, that each service that you design it has very good granular api so it actually provides too much information for the client and uh, it may end up in um, calling your service multiple times for, for a single request, which is like not very good from the network perspective and from the performance. Uh, another limitation is that some services may use protocols that are not very uh, web friendly. Um, I don't know, gRPC, for example, or uh, Drift binary RPC or whatever else. So it would be hard from the client side to call this and endpoints in your services with, with these protocols. And another difficult uh, part and challenge here is that making some changes for some of the services can force the client to do the change on their side. So let's imagine that in this case, you have your order service, for example, and for some reason, you decided to make it even more solid and split it into two services. The, the first one is actual order, which uh, gives you a list of um, orders that were done in the past. And the second service is the payment, which gives you all information about payment process that, that were done during these orders. Uh, I don't know, credit cards, payment types, whatever else. And uh, the general logic is still the same. So in terms of client, nothing changed. But you require your client to, to introduce one more and point one more new service. So instead of seven API calls, you will do eight right now, which most probably will not make your front-end developers happy. The usually a much better approach is to use uh, what is known as an API gateway. Uh, an API gateway is a server 
that um, that is the single entry point into your system. Um, you may think of it about kind of a facade pattern from the object-oriented uh, design. And uh, API Gateway usually hides unneeded complexity from the client and expose the simple interface outside. So in general, API Gateway is responsible for request routing. Uh, so it actually decides which services it should call during one client request. Uh, it's responsible also for composition. So in, during one request, you may send, um, you may call multiple services and API Gateway handles it for you. And uh, as well, it does the protocol translation. So right now it doesn't matter for the client at all, which protocol you are using internally. API Gateway um, does all the magic for them. You also have another option, which is uh, known as backends for frontends. In this case, you have uh, split your API gateway per client type. So for web application, you will have one specific gateway for mobile, another, and for everything else, you can have even more. The backend service is still the same. Um, why, you, why you might need it is because in some cases, of course, it, it all depends on, on your individual case, but Sometimes you want to um, have a different logic per client type. So for example, for web application, we have much more data to request than uh, comparing to the mobile app. And that's why you, you need to, you may want to uh, do it in this approach. But again, uh, it's not necessary. You, you can start from this. It will be much simpler and um, just, can consider an, uh, this variation as an option for the future. And uh, of course, uh, nothing is free. And besides benefits, you will have also drawbacks of API Gateway usage. The first one is, uh, in the end, uh, API Gateway is just a, another highly available component in your architecture. So it, it's obvious that it should be developed, deployed, um, you should put some logic there. I mean, you should definitely define the contract that you're exposing to the client, which endpoints, uh, which endpoints in the backend, backend you should call, and and so on. So, it's a kind of full feature service, one more in your infrastructure. Another drawback is that sometimes it will happen that if you update the service, the backend service, you may need to update the gateway as well. Uh, for example, you added a new endpoint or introduced some new parameters to, to the already existing endpoints. So previously, you had to do one change in one service, but right now, if you are introducing the gateway, you need to deploy them both, basically. And uh, another, another drawbacks and negative part is that introducing the gateway in between the client and the backend services is just one more additional network hub. So you, it will be a bit more. But however, for most real world applications, uh, it makes sense to use API Gateway at least to consider it as an option. Let's check um, implementations that we have. Um, to be honest, we have really a lot of possibilities in the market right now. I just listed some of them which let's say are the most popular. And um, of course you can do your own implementation as always, but um, in general, all these tools give more or less same functionality. Of course, with some individual cases, uh, but in the end they are all gateways. And uh, the tool that I want to show you today is um, API 6. So, API 6 is a gateway based on Nginx and etcd. Uh, actually, it uses the OpenResty or Tengen as a basic environment. Both of them, I mean, OpenResty and Tengen, they are based on Nginx, but provide a bit more functionality to you. Uh, let's say it's the Nginx on steroids. 
Uh, I will say a few words about each of them so you can compare and decide. Uh, Tenjin, um, again, based on Nginx, on, on a specific version, they have the backwards compatibility, so they move the updates from Nginx to Tenjin and the opposite way. It has some cool features for monitoring, load balancing methods, and uh, support the Lua scripts that can, that can be um, introduced dynamically. This Tenjin is created by Taobao Group, and it's like, pretty popular right now. Uh, the second option that you have is an open RST. Probably you already hear about it, but uh, just a few words. Um, basically, it's the same Nginx uh, plus Lua plus cool features. That's long story short. And uh, I can tell, tell you even more. The Tenjinx developers, Tenjin, sorry, Tenjin developers, they support the open rest some time ago they contributed a lot of new features and so on and so on but after some time they decided to create their own basically and they call it tangent um, i will not like do the precise comparing right now during the current presentation because i will not have time for it both of them are good. Both both of them are well known and proven in the real production environment. Uh, I prefer Open Resty just because, in my opinion, it's kind of more popular right now, and um, I'm able to find more information about it uh, if I need to. But um, again, it's up to you what what exactly you want to choose. So uh, I can give you small uh, intro in open resty um, for those who didn't heard about it before um, you may think about it as an extension for nginx and one of the most popular features of open resty is a pluggable lua scripts so these scripts give you uh, a possibility to put some additional logic into your nginx web server and uh, for some tasks uh, this this case is perfectly fit. Um, yeah, by the way, uh, API 6 mostly based on Lua as well. So if you want to use it as an API gateway in your architecture, you definitely need to take a look on it and, uh, and get some basic knowledge. Uh, but no worries, uh, don't be afraid. Lua is a very, very friendly programming language. It's similar to Python, and it wouldn't take much time for you uh, to get some basic experience, uh, especially if you already know some programming language. Um, then, yeah, even more, it, would, it will take you I don't know, approximately one day to learn Lua basics. And uh, you may wonder why um, they decided to use Lua. Uh, and the answer is because Lua was designed to be pluggable into different systems. And basically, that's why it was created. Uh, you can see that uh, a lot of companies right now is using the Lua in the background. That, that's like a known technology. You don't need to scare about it. Um, it's used pretty everywhere, starting from e-commerce, then games, then medicine application, whatever else. And uh, everyone likes it because of its cool features that it has. So uh, just a short, Lua is fast, it's embeddable, you can plug it in different uh, systems. It's small, so the tar ball, it, like, it's really, really small, you don't need to put something heavy in your system, and uh, it's easy to learn. Uh, also, uh, which is important, I guess, the Lua is fast, not only in let's say synthetic benchmark, so the tuned be benchmark, uh, but it, it, it is fast in real life as well. And uh, even more, if you need uh, a lot more speed, you can try Lua JIT. Uh, it's an independent implementation of Lua, uh, which using a just-in-time compiler, which, is actually, which actually is used in uh, API 6 implementation. And uh, the second important part of API 6 is ETCD. ETCD is a consistent and distributed key value storage. Uh, it's written in Golang, and uh, also it, um, it's well known 
it's pretty popular right now and uh, it used in a lot of application uh, as an infrastructure related that data storage uh, for example etcd is used in uh, as a crucial component for uh, kubernetes uh, where it stores the entire state of cluster, uh, its configuration, specification, all the statuses of all running instances and, and the workloads. So, um, yeah, you can you can trust this technology. And uh, API 6 as well is using ATCD to store configurations. And it also ensures availability of the entire gateway system, even with even in case when any server is down. Um, there is an article about the API 6 where they put some benchmarks between ETCD and the different storages. So they compare ETCD with the Keeper, with console and so on. Uh, I will not put it here because it's a kind of a different topic, but uh, you, may, you may find um, then explanation why exactly they choose this ETCD technology for the uh, storage. And um, yeah, let's start from the API 6 internals. I will give you uh, an overview of it. So you will have the entry point of uh, going deeper if you want. So as you can see, the API 6 is basically split on two main uh, logical points. The right one, uh, you can see it on the top, is a control plan, control plane. Uh, this actually gives you a control of all operations that you as an administrator is doing with your API, API gateway. So you can change that, some settings, put uh, update configuration, do whatever you want. Uh, it uses the RBAC roles inside. So it allows you, it allows only some special users to do some special actions. It has the dashboard, uh, which I will show you a bit later, but um, to be honest, it doesn't support all features right now. And basically it doesn't need to because you also have the full featured API for ad admin panel, let's say for administrative tasks that you may have. And uh, you can do whatever you want there. And the second part, which is actually the gateway itself is a data plane. So this part is responsible for actual logic of uh, routing and orchestrating your requests. Uh, it handles the request, it, it, it runs some plugins and do some actions. Of course, it checks the uh, configurations that you set as administrator to it, and it does some actions based on it. Um, I will show you the small example of, uh, of the use case that, uh, that we had. So you will get a bit more information of in which way you can use it. So in our particular case, we had an, we had an issue when we had multiple legacy sites, which has, um, let's call it user management system inside. Each of these sites has basically the same logic. So all of them has authorization, create account logic, authentication and so on. And at some point we decided that it, it's not very cool for us because if you if you need to change something you obviously need to go and change in multiple places so we decided to go with service approach and we created an, another service uh, that um, handles only user specific logic actually it's a group of services but it doesn't matter for now so uh, the case was that the initial agreement was that we are going to use the grpc as a protocol in the backend uh, services. And the idea that was initially is uh, user, end user will go to the, I don't know, login page. It will fill the login and password, send the request, click, I don't know, submit. Uh, request is going from the front end to the legacy backend. And uh, the backend itself will call the gRPC service and will that will do the magic. And basically write on the response to the front end. At some point it was okay, but then um, we decided that we can avoid this legacy backend in the middle. So we can uh, send the request from the front end directly to our backend, just because we can and it makes more sense. So then we faced another problem is that 
we developed our services using gRPC protocol, which is not very friendly for the clients. So at some point we have to choose what, what to do in this case. And uh, we have multiple options. And uh, just because we are lazy, we didn't want to create and expose the rest uh, endpoints for it. We just have our tested gRPC service and it perfectly fits all our needs. So we decided to go actually with API gateway. And uh, the way we did it is we put a gateway between the client and uh, the, actually the front-end client and the back-end gRPC service. And as you can see here, uh, it's just the part of the configuration file, but it actually has the main logic inside. So for us, we accept the post request from the client. Actually, the, the API gateway accepts the post request from the client. Then it does the request validation. It checks the basic stuff like login, password, whatever. Then it uses the gRPC transcode plugin, which does the transformation from the HTTP to gRPC, send the request to the backend services and send it back, transform it and give it to the client. So using this small configuration file, it took us, I don't know, not, not much time at all to introduce this new uh, gateway and to actually solve our problem. Uh, the benefits that we also have here of using the API 6 is their beautiful, I would say, uh, plugin system and modular system. So you are able to connect as many plugins as you want. You can you can write your your own. So in this case, we need we started from request validation and uh, gRPC transcode, but later we may want to add some basic authorization, for example or rate limits or i don't know whatever else that you can imagine that you can put on the server side uh, logic and um, the overview of plugin how it works is that uh, when request comes to the api gateway it checks the atcd to check the router to get to get the list of plugins that it uh, needs to apply then it takes some plugins from the memory. If you have some uh, unloaded plugins, it will do the load for you. And then it runs them in the order that you define through the admin panel or the uh, admin API. And it actually does the job for you. The cool thing as well is that uh, during the implementation, your own plugin, or uh, if you are investigating the already existing one, you can see that um, plugin itself it has a logic that fully covers all nginx uh, events that that has uh, that it has so you can put um, something for actually every step of nginx that is processing the the request and the response so uh, in our case it, it helped a lot um, another features that uh, api 6 provides is um, Actually, it's like a bunch of them. Uh, it has the multi-protocol, so it can work with gRPC, as I said. It can work as transcoding, so transform from HTTP to gRPC and around and back to the HTTP. It can also be for you as a gRPC proxy, so it will take gRPC request and proxy to another backend if you need. Uh, web sockets, HTTP, HTTPS, whatever, whatever you you want, it, it supports for you. If no, you can always introduce something. Actually, the only limitation that you have is the nginx limitation because in both ways, doesn't matter if you are choosing the engine or uh, OpenResty as a platform for uh, API six. They both based on nginx, so you are kind of limited to uh, to an option that in nginx provides. So that's that you may uh, take into consideration. Um, another cool features is the full dynamic stuff. So to introduce new plugin or to introduce new logic that you that you have, you don't need to restart your nginx. You just uh, do the API call to the admin and uh, it will does the job for you immediately so uh, it works on the fly uh, also it has the basic load balancing features some health health checks the circuit breaker and and so on so it may be also useful for your case 
of course, security stuff, any kind of authentication, uh, limit uh, requests. So it's like rate limit. You can cut off some traffic that you are suspect, suspecting as a fraud or spam or actually whatever you need. As well, the request validator, it has the basic logic inside. Uh, of course, it's not fully featured and it's not so powerful like you may have on the backend services uh, implemented in, I don't know, Java, Python, Go, PHP, whatever else language you are using. But at least something, you can start from it, you can uh, extend it, and it will not take you a lot of time to do this. The next huge amount of uh, features that it has, it, it's related to the infrastructure stuff. So it supports it supports the tracing, so you can use Zipkin. It can expose metrics to the Prometheus. Um, actually, it can do a lot of stuff in terms of infrastructure uh, logic. Of course, it has a dashboard I will show you soon. And uh, the general idea of creator uh, of this API 6 it was it, it was developed in China by one of the Chinese companies, and it's pretty popular there. Uh, from from the users, um, the one that you may hear is the Huawei, Meizu, NASA, and uh, yeah. But most of the companies that are at least presented on the GitHub page, on you know the section where this technology is used by this and these companies, uh, most of them are Chinese. So. Uh, the, the creator of actually the CEO of this company, the idea behind the API 6 and the API gateways in general, uh, he told that all logic that is not related to your business needs, uh, infrastructure logic, metrics, I don't know, uh, tracing, whatever else you have, like load balancing and, uh, and, and other stuff, you can put it in the API gateway site, so you can move it outside of your application. Uh, one of the possible and maybe interesting use case for you, it might be the retry logic. So um, you can you can implement the retry in your backend service, but you can do it as well on the API gateway site once, and it will be used everywhere. For example, you want to re do retries like three times on uh, 500 error from the backend service and uh, API 6 will do it for you. And even more, you can send the proper metrics. So, okay, for this endpoint, in average, we have, uh, I don't know, 17 retries per week or something like that. So you will have fully monitored uh, logic on the API Gateway side. Yeah, this is the dashboard. Uh, I will show you just the, just the screen because it actually doesn't, I don't have time to, to go through all features that it provides. But again, just for you to know, um, this API dashboard doesn't have, doesn't support a lot of stuff that is available on the actual API calls to the admin endpoint. Uh, but at least it's something you can, you can show it as some fancy tool to your manager or well, probably to DevOps it will not work because they will, yeah, they will not accept it. They will prefer the uh, API, API calls instead. Uh, but yeah, you have this feature. Uh, there is also the simple um, uh, simple um, check with uh, Kong. Kong is basically one of the competitors. And um, this I took from the official API 6 web, actually from the GitHub. Uh, as you can see, both of them supports the basic functionality, like the upstreams, the health check, the L4 and L7 proxy and so on. Uh, but API 6 has some benefits comparing to the Kong. Um, the most important, and you can, you can uh, I will give you all references in the end, but uh, the most important, as they said, is that it's just faster. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, we we have this philosophy that uh, we don't trust uh, anyone, and we we need to compare it. We need to benchmark it, but at least you you have something that that you can rely on. And uh, yeah, that's all. Um, another another thing that I wanted also to mention is that um, don't think that this API six is one of the millions forbidden forgotten rep uh, repositories on the GitHub. 
it's pretty fresh. It has only uh, two years history of development, but it's already a part of Apache infrastructure ecosystem. And uh, it actually evolves a lot during uh, entire time of, of living. So they constantly put a lot of features, their response on all your questions that, that you may have and so on. And um, this that's the most funniest graphic that I have. It's the contributors over time because all of you guys knows that basically, to be honest, it doesn't show anything, but at least uh, it signals you that the amount of developers that are interested in um, in this technology is rising from time to time and even more the developers want to take a part of the um, actual implementation of the service and uh, yeah it, it's something good in, in terms of uh, api6 yeah here is the reference that i have i will send you them after so you can go uh, and uh, check it by yourself. Maybe you want to go deeper and uh, maybe I didn't cover some, some topic. For sure, I didn't cover it because of lack of the time. And uh, yes, so that's the time for your question, guys. Uh, just to mention, uh, I didn't want to uh, show the full features, like the very precise details, the goal like the, my personal goal for this presentation was just to give you a short overview, just to give you um, an entry point, basically. So I hope that you are interested in something like this. And uh, it will be cool if you, after this, at least consider an API 6 uh, as an option for, for your API Gateway, if you have such. So, yeah, and sorry, the last one from, from me uh, about this. Um, if, you, if you need more support from the API 6 guys, they also offers the enterprise version, which they, uh, uh, you, will, you will be surprised, but they call it API 7. Probably they spent a lot of time on, on, on thinking about naming. But yeah, in, in any case, you will not be alone, so you can uh, check for... Um, check for some support. Okay, let's uh, let me turn on the camera and we can some questions that you have. Feel free to put them now or uh, if you need time to think, that's okay, take your time. We can, I will check them later and answer. So the first question is from Bosco, uh, Mongo versus ETCD. Mongo is a documentary database, ETCD is K value storage, so they, kind of bit different. Um, each of those database, data, databases are great. It's well known and they basically cool, but they used kind of for different um, use cases. So it heavily depends on what you have and what you're going to achieve, what you need to store and in which way you need to retrieve it from your storage. Um, what uh, Florian asks, what are the advantages of Prometheus over Zabbix? Is Prometheus becoming the industry industry standard? Um, it's hard to say what is industry standard for now. It, it definitely becomes more and more popular. Um, comparing to a Zabbix, uh, I guess it, it very depends on your preferences. They offer more or less same functions, but again with some individual cases and um, for us we are using Prometheus it's not because Zabbix are bad it's just because we choose this technology and it perfectly fits all we need and uh, about the advantages of Prometheus uh, um, I will not be able to to say it right now uh, comparing to a Zabbix but you may want, you may need to, to check it. Yeah, I guess this video will be posted on the Quantox YouTube. Yeah. So uh, let me check uh, if there is another question. First time to hear for Lua. Uh, that's okay, perfect. Uh, I'm glad that you, that you learned something new. Just try it. Uh, if you know some other programming, programming language, um, 
you will see that getting the basics of Lua will not take a lot of time and your personal resources and yeah to to take a basic it's like cool warm programming language uh, that is pretty popular and uh, you you don't need to spend one seven, two several years to learn it comparing for example to scala java or something like this so the languages that are that have more features and yeah they're a bit different but anyway so yeah i'm kind of out of the time so um you will not time, take time with the next presenter i hope that you enjoyed um again um that's just an introduction for you you may go deeper if you have some questions uh, take your time and uh, please ask them on the chat or you can ask for my contacts i will ask i will answer you later and uh, nice to see you here on our quantex meetup and uh, yeah good luck with learning new things thanks a lot for your attention and my I would uh, say that everything went perfectly. I'm glad to see that there are a lot of questions uh, from the audience. Just keep asking. So we have another presenter and like uh, popular face says, uh, the last but not the least. The next one is Marco. Marco is a QA engineer from a niche office. He has vast experience in mentorship programs and also he is a mad geek. So Marco, you can start. Uh, thank you, Nadja. Uh, good evening to, to you all. Uh, thanks for such a, a nice uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Marko Dicinovic uh, and uh, tonight uh, I will be talking uh, about a bit uh, of future technologies uh, and I will put uh, the most focus uh, on machine learning and on automation testing. Uh, I will try to correlate those two and try to uh, in some way um, influence uh, you to uh, let's, uh, let's, let's say it uh, uh, dug deeper uh, inside the uh, whole uh, materia and try to find yourselves uh, inside uh, inside of it. Okay, I will present a bit the, the full screen. So, since I will be having a lot of small font on my presentation. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, mm, technically, in IT industry, I'm for about uh, eight years now, I guess. Uh, time sure flies. Uh, apart from those eight, uh, uh, three years in, in Quantux uh, technology as, as a company. Um, currently, I'm working as a QA senior automation engineer, uh, but I'm uh, mostly focused on Java and uh, Selenium automation. Um, 
I am kind of a little bit uh, uh, polyvalent in the terms of interests uh, because I always like math and physics. Uh, this kind of boosts uh, my uh, uh, my knowledge uh, to, to the point when I wanted uh, to try something new, something innovative. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why I uh, uh, started investigating uh, uh, some different fields like uh, machine learning or quantum computing, for example. Uh, you can easily relate machine learning with the interest in, in math and uh, 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 quantum with <laughs> uh, the interest in physics. Um, and uh, uh, the reason for that is uh, that I really think uh, those two technologies are going to be one of the most influential uh, in the world uh, in the next uh, decades. Um, Related to the hobbies, uh, maybe uh, it sounds that I'm like a boring person, but I'm an uh, environmentalist at heart, uh, and uh, it's not that bad uh, as it sounds. Uh, I think <laughs> many of you should, uh, should try. Okay, now uh, let's go to the, to the interesting stuff. Uh, I know it's a little bit surprising for starting with the nanotechnology uh, here, because uh, it was not in the, in the scope. Uh, but uh, I kind of, as uh, every QA, decided to take a little bit uh, uh, detour and uh, outside of the box thinking. Uh, so um, decided to first uh, um, talk to you a little bit about some technologies, the future technologies, uh, which would influence the, the future, uh, by my opinion. Uh, and they all can correlate with the AI and they all uh, can correlate between themselves and they can all uh, have uh, uh, some uh, influence to, to each other and to our lives. Uh, the nanotechnology is uh, kind of uh, with us for many years now uh, and uh, um, technically when we are uh, you know uh, thinking about it uh, we are not aware of it completely <laughs> because uh, everything it creates it is so small uh, but when you see you know on the TV that uh, uh, for example the uh, future weapons uh, are created to be not bigger but smaller uh, when you're looking at your phones and you know that uh, they are actually much more powerful than any computers which were so so much greater in size uh, when you try to fry your pancakes and they do not uh, stick uh, you know to, to the bottom of the, of the frying pot uh, you understand that oh that's uh, not how the, the pots uh, used to be right uh, they are different now because the, the technology advanced and the materials that we are using are not the same as they used to be. And now maybe I'm uh, a little bit uh, uh, talking uh, from the theory perspective and uh, outside of the box, uh, but uh, all of those things uh, are related uh, uh, through the testing itself. And that is uh, why I think uh, this, uh, this is very, very important. Uh, the next technology uh, which uh, we can focus on uh, is the blockchain. Uh, but when I say the blockchain, uh, I do not uh, mean the, the blockchain as a Bitcoin, you know, because many people uh, are kind of putting uh, uh, the equal sign uh, between uh, those. Uh, blockchain is much more than, than that. Uh, it has the, the potential to influence not just the economics, but also the law. Mm, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, it uh, really uh, can be, uh, let's say, used to remind us of one golden rule. Uh, if we were aware of this technology, of its potential, if we had a trust in it, let's say, 10 years ago, I think that our lives would be significantly better now. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't or we didn't have the, the chance to use that. But uh, uh, technically, uh, the timing is the key. It has always been and uh, uh, it will be in, in the future, even more. Uh, so here on this slide, you can see one small example which we found on, on Twitter uh, from the uh, StarCraft game, you know, uh, from the time when uh, there was uh, a rewarding uh, with uh, the, uh, the money and rewarding with the Bitcoins. 
And you can see there how little Bitcoins were appreciated by them, uh, how the, the people uh, were not uh, uh, able to see uh, and uh, to understand the potential that it had. Uh, right now, the situation is uh, pretty pretty much different and we are having uh, different chains. We are having, uh, let's say, Bitcoin as the most uh, uh, the most known one. We are having the Ethereum, the Ripple, and now <laughs> lately uh, the Dogecoin, which is uh, kind of uh, interesting, uh, but uh, uh, very unorthodox. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, no matter from which angle you are watching uh, uh, this, um, in the future, uh, this will uh, this will have a very heavy impact on economy. Uh, and uh, uh, no matter what we do, I don't think that we are at the point now that we can evade this. Uh, this is important. Why? Uh, it's important because the next one on the list is uh, quantum computing. Now, when I say quantum computing uh, at this point, uh, I'm not sure that uh, many people will uh, find something interesting in it or find it that much intriguing because it's not uh, that known. It's not something which we can uh, always hear about. It's not something um, which uh, is uh, in the media. Uh, but quantum computing has the same potential as uh, the, uh, the blockchain had, you know, and just its potential will be seen uh, in the years to come. Uh, the quantum computing is based on the quantum mechanics, uh, basically. It has a really, really strong uh, uh, cryptography. Uh, it's, uh, some people say they're impossible to break. Uh, I do not agree. Uh, I kind of uh, have been investigating this uh, for my master's degree at uh, uh, my faculty, mm, but uh, uh, it is certainly a very, very uh, convenient method of increasing your safety. Uh, for example, the quantum canal between the Pentagon and, White and the White House uh, is used only in uh, the situations of the high importance. Uh, quantum computing uh, uh, as, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a future strategy uh, is uh, um, kind of um, very uh, at the beginning at the moment uh, because uh, the prices of the computers uh, are very, very high. Uh, you can Google them uh, if you like, uh, you will be a little bit scared at first. Uh, then you will understand why the prices are so high when you see the, the magnitude of the computers. Uh, but uh, moreover, when you see their possibilities. Uh, the quantum computers uh, work on the qubits. Uh, uh, it's kind of uh, the, the atomic unit. Uh, and the qubit uh, is uh, um, totally different from the regular bit, you know. Uh, the regular bit, which we are using all, all the time, uh, has only two discrete states, zero and one. Uh, you can imagine a qubit as some sphere with the radius of one. And which point on that rate, uh, on that sphere can be one uh, superposition state? So you can imagine how many, uh, uh, how many power uh, those uh, computers with that uh, uh, much, uh, let's say, options uh, can generate. Uh, there are, uh, let's say, uh, many algorithms. Uh, which you could call them uh, uh, really uh, dangerous algorithms at this moment, uh, which can uh, uh, break the, the cryptogra uh, cryptography on almost, uh, I would say, all uh, the protections that we are having right now, but uh, on a vast majority of them. Uh, and uh, because all of those uh, facts, uh, the quantum computing is still uh, at big uh, beginnings. Uh, it won't be introduced that soon. Uh, but uh, we can talk about, let's say, in 10 years. Uh, and uh, we can see uh, then uh, if uh, this still stands. Now up to the next one. Artificial intelligence. Uh, okay, this is finally the, the one that uh, we are interested in. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, the fact about uh, uh, artificial intelligence is that uh, uh, apart uh, from you know knowing where it can be used uh, at today's time uh, it's actually really difficult to uh, to pinpoint uh, uh, anything uh, where this uh, is not used you know uh, it started to infiltrate inside our lives uh, to the point where we do not actually see it but it is with us uh, for example how many times uh, were you surfing the youtube uh, seeing the different videos uh, and afterwards uh, when you return you will see the videos which by some chance sound very interesting uh, which you have, uh, you know, your actions to, to click on them, your actions to, to see them. Uh, and uh, all of this uh, is uh, doing, uh, doing uh, all the machine learning algorithms, which are feeding us with the data uh, for which uh, it, uh, uh, let's say, considers uh, that the probability, probability is the highest possible for us to uh, uh, to be um, kind of uh, influenced, you know, mm, because uh, if uh, we are having some interests, you know, past interests, um, it will uh, kind of uh, uh, evidence all that, uh, and uh, uh, it will uh, uh, run this through its uh, algorithms, and it will find the, the next one, which is most likely uh, going to be the one uh, which we are interested in, really. And that is the magic. That is the magic, and that is something uh, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, in our lives for a couple of, uh, past couple of years, I think, uh, without us even knowing. Um, now, uh, regarding the artificial intelligence, uh, um, we are let's say, having some kind of uh, uh, issues with understanding what we are actually meaning with these terms, you know. Uh, we can hear them now pretty often. We can hear the terms artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. Uh, but without uh, going deeper inside the, the material itself, uh, uh, we are not able to pinpoint uh, uh, what are the differences and what are the similarities between them. So, uh, I will start uh, uh, this presentation by, uh, let's say, explaining the, the differences between those. Um, artificial intelligence is a term, uh, is, uh, let's say, the umbrella discipline, you know, it covers everything. Uh, you, can, uh, you can use it uh, as something general, and uh, you cannot make a mistake uh, there. Uh, but machine learning and deep learning are uh, much more uh, precise terms, you know, and uh, uh, they are kind of related uh, because the deep learning is the uh, subset of machine learning. Uh, you can call it the elite, <laughs> if you like, but uh, uh, in, in those terms, uh, the deep learning uh, is uh, something uh, which uh, has, uh, let's say, the, the brightest future uh, and uh, uh, has uh, the, the best uh, value uh, in terms uh, of, uh, of performance. We will see a little bit later uh, about, uh, about that. Uh, okay. Now, um, when I say uh, that deep learning uh, uh, is uh, uh, more, um, let's just say, optimal, you can see why here. Uh, so in this graph, uh, which uh, is, uh, let's say, shows the relation of amount of data which you're having to the performance. Uh, you see that uh, if you're uh, using traditional machine learning algorithms, uh, you are going to have uh, uh, a flattening the, the curve, which is popular now, right? Um, you're going to have it after some time. And uh, then uh, you will not be able to uh, do some kind of vast improvements to that. Maybe to the some uh, small, um, uh, small range, but not too much. Uh, deep learning uh, on the other side is different. Uh, as you can see, uh, it raises through, through the time. Uh, it doesn't go, uh, I mean, it goes down at some point, but it's not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, going to be flat. Uh, it's going to, to raise just uh, with a smaller angle. Uh, so uh, uh, why uh, is this? 
uh, and uh, what are the advantages of deep learning we will see a little bit later on uh, for now on uh, there are two important things to, to know uh, the deep learning is kind of uh, some kind of replication of the human brain uh, why do I say that? Uh, we all have, let's say, uh, the, the brain suite or the, the nerves uh, inside of it, uh, and uh, also uh, all of them are kind of making some kind of network, neural network. Uh, but uh, uh, in our in our world, in world of deep learning, uh, these uh, uh, neural networks are the artificial uh, artificial neural networks. Um, and each one of them uh, um, has uh, uh, its own uh, kind of um, uh, sum uh, of uh, some uh, vectors, uh, the multiplication of some vectors, uh, which uh, is made uh, uh, depending on the data that we that we are having. Uh, so for now, uh, the only thing uh, which uh, we can say is that uh, these uh, deep learning networks can have multiple layers, as you can see on this picture. Uh, they can have a different topologies, you know, if you imagine this as a graph, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the topology here is quite interesting one, but you will see on the internet so many different ones uh, and don't be surprised because that uh, uh, difference in creating those topologies is one of the main advantages with the deep learning over the traditional machine learning algorithms. Uh, also, you can see there uh, are four, let's say, uh, four most uh, common and known uh, uh, deep learning uh, uh, architectures. Uh, uh, of course, they're all out of the scope of this um, of this presentation. But if you are interested, uh, you may want you may want to, to look at that a little bit more. Uh, okay, the next thing uh, which is very very important uh, is the hyperparameters. Uh, hyperparameters uh, are basically put. Uh, the parameters uh, which configure uh, our our neural network. You know, uh, so uh, as you can see here, we have a multiple layers in network, uh, but uh, uh, we let's say can have n of them. Uh, but uh, by changing their hyperparameters, we are uh, actually um, changing the learning uh, rate inside of it. Uh, we can um, kind of uh, put some input. Uh, change the parameters and then watch the, the output. Uh, depending on uh, how we change them, a really, really great impact uh, on, on the result itself. Uh, and depending on what, uh, 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 what decision we make there, uh, we may uh, create a, a perfect model, you know, and we can create a terrible model. Uh, so uh, that's something uh, which uh, uh, has uh, um, uh, kind of, uh, which is related to the talent of some person, so I will tell you uh, the one well, interesting story afterwards. Uh, but from now on, uh, the important thing is uh, to uh, see that uh, all of these uh, uh, learning procedures uh, have uh, um, kind of goal. Uh, to get to some stable state. You know, you can see the, the picture, uh, which is the, the lowest here on slide. And we are having uh, these, uh, mm, let's say, three graphs. And uh, uh, the, these red arrows uh, represent the, the solution, which is, you know, kind of uh, targeting, the, the co converging to the uh, middle. Uh, that middle is the, the wanted state, the target state, uh, and if we use these steps to be too small, uh, our uh, model will be too inefficient, you know, because uh, it will take too, too much time. Uh, if we take this learning rate to be a big, uh, we can easily miss that sweet spot that we are looking for, you know, as on the first picture. Uh, so the magic is to choose the, the right. Uh, and that is, uh, let's say, the, uh, maybe the biggest lesson here. Uh, 
on the um, this uh, uh, grid layouts and ran random layouts uh, um, we can see uh, the, uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, a parameter uh, compar comparison you know uh, depending on the weight of the parameter you know uh, some parameters can be very important uh, other uh, pretty much uh, not. Uh, so uh, here we can see uh, this uh, green line at the top uh, with the sweet spot, the, the one with, uh, the, which is the highest, you know. And if we are using uh, the, the grid layout, the, some standardized uh, network, uh, as you can see here, uh, with, with using this one, uh, we actually missed that, that spot. We got some other, right? Uh, it has uh, some value, uh, but it's not optimal. Uh, it's not uh, the perfect one. And on the other hand, uh, if we are, let's say, uh, using the random approach at this point, and uh, uh, without any um, kind of limitations, we can see that here we got that that spot. So that's one of the interesting things which can happen all the time, and that is why we are continuously trying to find a better and better models. Okay, uh, now uh, let's uh, kind of focus on machine learning as, uh, as a whole. Uh, the machine learning uh, uh, can be divided uh, uh, into three kind of uh, large subgroups. Um, and uh, uh, those uh, groups are, uh, you know, let's say, related to the supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. We're going to go through all of them, uh, say a couple of things, and uh, also choose some of those uh, um, other kind of uh, um, uh, methods, algorithms, uh, for example, for clustering, uh, for classification, and for regression. Uh, those are the, the most important ones uh, and uh, the ones which uh, can give us the, the best uh, picture and uh, uh, which uh, we can find the, the value inside. You know, we can easily uh, find the uh, situation from the real life when we can actually um, uh, see how they are used and not just used, the, the efficiently, efficiently used. Now, uh, let's start uh, with the first one, mm, and this is uh, uh, it's related to the uh, supervised learning. Mm, let's talk about, uh, let's talk a little, a little bit about the uh, whole process here. Uh, imagine this, uh, you're working for some big company, uh, you are constantly uh, getting a lot of uh, different data, you know, uh, and uh, that data uh, is, uh, you know, data from the all sides. Uh, it uh, has so many different uh, uh, outputs, uh, so much uh, different uh, types, and uh, uh, you uh, just want to somehow classify that data. Uh, so therefore, uh, when you're trying to do this, uh, uh, you are going to uh, have to use some kind of algorithm, you know, to, to uh, automatically do this job for you. Because if you do this by yourself, you, let's say, uh, wouldn't have a, a good time. Uh, so uh, to be able to use that, you're going to create a model which, are, which is going to filter this data for you. Uh, but how you're going to, to create it? Uh, uh, technically, uh, here uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, um, this learning process, uh, very, very, this is where it takes place. Um, it's uh, uh, very important because uh, uh, by using this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, learning process, we create our model, and afterwards that model is free to go and free to finish everything that we need. Uh, how do we do that? We have some kind of training data. Uh, training data is the trusted data, the safe data, the data that uh, which we are confident in, uh, and uh, uh, which is, uh, let's say, characteristic for the supervised learning. Uh, the training data has output values. So you're having inputs and outputs. With all of those, you can train your model and learn it to expect 
the uh, current results uh, which will depend on your actions. Uh, now, uh, by doing this, uh, you can easily, let's say, uh, when you um, kind of uh, learn how to divide the data on the test, uh, data, you know, when you learn your model like that, you can apply that to the, your regular data and do your job very quickly and efficiently. Now, uh, two mostly known algorithms uh, are classification and regression, uh, but uh, they are very, uh, vastly different uh, in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, usage. So let's explain both of them uh, on uh, life uh, life examples. You know uh, uh, some uh, issues uh, which we probably all had, uh, and uh, we were not even uh, we were not uh, even aware uh, that we had the help of this of these algorithms. Uh, the example for the classification is uh, one regular spam email. Uh, how many times did you get an email uh, which uh, was uh, redirected to your spam folder without you even noticing, you know? Um, and uh, after you, for example, discovered that mail, you say, oh, it was really a spam, you know, they didn't get it wrong, but how did they know? Um, that is where a uh, classification algorithm took place. Um, uh, what actually happened there? Uh, the kind of guys who uh, divide, uh, who created that software, had some kind of training data, training emails, training uh, um, uh, spam emails, and training regular uh, emails. Uh, and then they created some set of rules. Uh, which are the indicators that some uh, mail can be spam, and which are the indicators that some mail is not spam. And then they put all of the data inside the matrix or inside the tensor or inside of any data uh, data keeper, let's call it that way. Uh, and uh, then they performed uh, uh, many uh, mathematical operations with that. Uh, and after that, let's say, uh, calcul calculating is performed and done, they were able, depending on the result, to classify the spam in one or in other category. So, you get the mail, it goes through the uh, selection process, you get discrete uh, result, is it spam or not. Uh, on the other hand, regression works a little bit differently. Um, I kind of like to, to call it uh, a future predicting one. Uh, in, re in the regression case, uh, you also have a testing data, you also have a result, you know, this is, are those dots, the red dots that you're having. Uh, but uh, in this case, you do not have two states or three states or you don't have the, uh, the will to classify those in one of them. Uh, you want to uh, draw a line so that the error margin is the smallest possible. What does that mean in practice? Uh, let's say uh, you want to buy a house. Uh, you want, uh, you know what uh, is the number of rooms that you want. You want uh, to be on the third floor. You want to be uh, kind of uh, head to bedrooms or something like that. All of those are the parameters. Uh, and you can define all of them to be, uh, let's say, uh, important or not important. Depending on that and depending on the similar flat similar houses, you're going to get the projected uh, price on this. And that is where the linear regression takes place. Now let's go to the next topic, and that is unsupervised learning. Uh, unsupervised learning is different uh, in terms that uh, you're having, uh, let's say, also you're having the data, also you're having the need to classify it but you do not have the outputs. So you do not have the, uh, the its states. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, uh, you can actually uh, let the, the algorithm do its own thing. Uh, you know, uh, what does that mean? Uh, we as humans uh, have, uh, let's say, a way of, of, uh, of uh, perceiving things uh, on our own way. 
uh, we see some things which are natural to us. Uh, so if we are, let's say, classifying some data, we are going to do on some of our thoughts on some on of the of some uh, some of our uh, thinking, but uh, we won't be able to see what machine sees. Uh, we won't be sometimes able to uh, see the relations between some of those results that machine is able to see. And if we let the algorithm does do its own thing, you know. Uh, we can then see uh, uh, things in new perspective. Uh, depending on which algorithm we use, uh, the clustering will be totally different. And uh, in some ways, uh, this uh, can uh, open uh, large uh, perspectives, new perspectives, and optimize some solutions to the point of, uh, let's say, uh, unbelief. Uh, okay, now a uh, quick overview to the uh, data uh, representation. So we were talking now about uh, uh, types of the algorithms which we use, uh, but uh, all of the, all of those algorithms uh, relate to the data. You know, they won't uh, uh, exist without it. They won't be efficient without it. And the ways to represent data uh, is uh, by using uh, uh, these uh, um, kind of uh, uh, types uh, of uh, data holders. Uh, we are having the scholars as the simple, uh, the simplest type, the, the vectors as the one dimension. Once the matrix is 2D array and the tensor, you know, the, the highest of one of them, you know, the one to rule them all. Uh, and uh, it's the n uh, dimension based array. So it has no limits. Uh, and uh, that is the most important thing because uh, the more dimensions we are having, uh, the more parameters are we taking into the concern, you know, uh, and the more accurate our, our models can be. Uh, so when you're hearing the terms of TensorFlow, for example, you know uh, what is the reason <laughs> behind all of that. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, there is something uh, uh, which I would like to pinpoint now, and uh, uh, it's the coefficients, uh, the weight coefficients. Uh, there are kind of uh, X factors in this story. Why? Uh, because uh, in our training, of the models, we are doing a lot of multiplication. You know, we multiplicate matrices and vectors and so on, uh, and many of them uh, represent the weights, uh, the actual importance of the data uh, that we are using. Uh, and uh, the most uh, crucial thing is to do a good approximation in this: how important that data is. Uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, a talent, you know, uh, in, in this job. Uh, and uh, uh, that's something uh, uh, which uh, is maybe the most difficult thing to, to do. Everything else is pretty much routine stuff. Uh, algorithms are known, data is, let's say, difficult to gather, but uh, when it's here, it's all, of the, it's all very simple. To, to do, uh, but uh, determining those values and getting the accurate data, uh, those two things are the two biggest challenges here. Now the third and the most powerful uh, algorithm uh, uh, is uh, the, the reinforcement learning, you know, uh, and uh, uh, this way uh, of uh, in talking can actually be a little bit scary when you think uh, what it can possibly do. Uh, I kind of uh, uh, gave here one table when we can make a comparison between all of those three uh, and uh, uh, can talk to you a little bit more about uh, uh, the way of uh, this uh, learning uh, works. Uh, so uh, in this case we are having something which is called a reward. Uh, the reward uh, is uh, um, some value which can vary uh, and the, 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 uh, as much as this reward goes higher, that means we are on the right track. Uh, if it goes lower, it means totally the, the opposite. And depending on that reward, we are choosing the next, uh, the, the next best action. 
uh, to to do. When I say we, I mean the the algorithm <laughs> which uh, which uh, is being run by us. Uh, so in those terms, the scary thing is that the machine can technically program itself uh, with or without us, maybe with a different efficiency, but in all of the cases, and can learn by by itself. And we can see how is this done. There's something called Q learning. Uh, I will take just uh, I will talk a little bit brief about uh, this uh, this algorithm here uh, because uh, it's a really uh, topic on its own. Um, but the the point is that we are having a system which can change states, and uh, the changing of the states uh, is uh, performing by actions. Uh, those actions are being performed depending on the rewards that we are getting as a feedback. Uh, so, uh, as you can see here, this agent that we are looking at is actually this machine, let's imagine, imagine it as a small robot, which is learning. That robot takes action uh, and uh, uh, it has a kind of consequence for what it's done. Depending on that consequence, there goes a reward, and depending on that reward, the next action is being decided on. Um, this whole process uh, can be uh, illustrated with this equation, you know, R0 plus gamma R1, etc., etc. Uh, and this equation uh, can uh, help us to understand how all of this works. works. Now, let's see it in the, in the practice. Uh, this whole process, uh, uh, let's call it like that, uh, can be called a uh, discounted uh, cumulative reward. Uh, so what you're, you're having here is a little bit bored, you know, uh, and you're having a sign and it's a goal. Now you uh, are uh, trying to get to that goal, but to take the most optimal path. Uh, of course, uh, your, rand uh, your actions at first uh, are going to be random, if you do not do not have uh, the expert to teach you to, to tell you uh, in the in the advance, you know, okay, you should go there and not there because the higher probability if you go there is to reach the goal uh, uh, faster. Um, but uh, 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 if you have the expert, you're going to get faster to your goal. Uh, but even if you do not have one, and that is the scary part, you can just try random actions, you know, and after some time. Uh, you're going to get to the goal, probably in the, let's say, uh, much uh, less optimal way, but you will get to the goal. So, which means that uh, the, the machine uh, will uh, get its knowledge at the end, no matter one way or another. Uh, and that is the, the interesting part uh, here. Uh, so, not to go further into the, the math uh, deeper here, because we do not have time for that, uh, we can just see one simple, uh, one simple example. Uh, when we are having uh, this uh, uh, R, uh, let's say, changing the states, changing uh, from one part of the table to the other. Uh, so, this is kind of deterministic uh, environment. When we are having already the values, you know, we can go from one to the to the other. Uh, and here, from this equation there, we can see how it's actually done. So this gamma uh, is, uh, has the value between uh, 0 and 1. Uh, and at the first step, you know, this is the first iteration, the first step, we are going to have it on the power of 1. Now, if we are going to take the second step, you know, uh, move the R even further, uh, then uh, we are going to uh, kind of uh, go into much more uh, accurate uh, um, uh, accurate state. Uh, but uh, uh, in those terms, uh, we are, let's say, uh, trying to, um, uh, to uh, get this score to be the highest possible. And with this one, uh, let's finish the machine learning part. Uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, go to the other one, uh, which is related to the testing. And turned one would be the symbiosis of those two. Uh, I'm not completely sure how much people in the audience uh, is from the QA world, so I will talk a little bit briefly about the testing, not uh, uh, not uh, much of the details, but just uh, taking the 
the most uh, uh, basic things. So uh, the testing itself can be divided uh, divided into uh, manual and automated. That is the, the basic uh, the, the basic division. Uh, the manual testers uh, um, are kind of uh, are working really hard, and uh, uh, their uh, time uh, and efficiency graph is not that good because they are doing uh, many things very uh, pretty much repetitively. Uh, they are trying to increase their uh, work, their, their revenue. But uh, uh, it's uh, impossible because the humans have their limits. Uh, machines don't. Uh, and that is why automated testing is very good and uh, can rescue us in the situations where we are having uh, uh, many repetitive tests. Uh, and uh, where do we have to, let's say, do some basic uh, stuff again and again and again. Uh, now, uh, this automation, automation testing process is uh, being done uh, with uh, a web driver. And here we can see the web driver architecture itself. So how it works. Uh, we write some kind of test script, you know, basically some programming like language, like uh, Java, like Python or something like that. And then uh, we are uh, kind of targeting the uh, web driver, you know, uh, Firefox, uh, Internet Explorer, Chrome or any else, um, which is uh, interacting, uh, interacting with our browsers. And therefore, on our browsers, uh, we can uh, kind of pinpoint the different elements uh, which we want to uh, target and which we want to interact with. Okay, uh, now uh, to uh, do this, uh, we are having different architectures. One of the, let's say, most common is the page object model. I do not have the time to speak about that one uh, right now because it's a pretty much story, pretty much a large story, large scope. The most important thing is that uh, each class is one page. And uh, with this uh, type uh, uh, of architecture, you can structure your tests more and make them much more uh, maintainable. Uh, the next uh, pretty much important thing uh, are the selectors. Uh, the selectors uh, uh, by themselves uh, are uh, being used to pinpoint the elements on the web page. Uh, and we can have different type uh, of selectors, uh, basically XPath and CSS ones um, are being uh, made constantly. Uh, and uh, by uh, creating them uh, in the most optimal way, uh, we are uh, making our tests uh, more robust. Uh, why is that important? Uh, because uh, in many cases, uh, the developers change and refactor the pages. Uh, therefore, your elements get lost. You know, they change, uh, uh, the indicators change, uh, the uh, hierarchy changes, and you have to maintain tests and create a new select. Uh, I'll show you later, uh, later a situation where you can actually create an um, uh, uh, algorithm to avoid this, this problem. Um, before that, uh, I would like to just refer to one uh, interesting thing uh, and uh, co a connection, correlation between testing and machine learning. Uh, this is uh, something special uh, here because uh, the testing itself is the only uh, let's call it entity, whatever you would like, uh, which has a double revenue here. Why do I say that? Well, uh, imagine this situation. You're having a test data. You're creating a model to improve your testing. Uh, you can see the, the connection there. It's something like a recursion in this case. Uh, the, most, uh, um, the more accurate data you're having, you're actually improving it uh, itself on the two different levels and exponentially and therefore by doing this you're providing your system a clean data and the data which is trusted and tested um, and in machine uh, uh, learning uh, uh, procedures the data is everything because that's something the, the hardest to get uh, and uh, uh, this has a, a very very large value it's very important and i would uh, let's say um, um, advise all the new QA guys and people who try to uh, go uh, to go inside their careers to that side uh, to have this in mind because in the future only by creating this kind of data you will be participating not only 
uh, in the testing uh, and uh, in uh, you know kind of confirming uh, um, of something which is already done you're going to create yourselves like the developers uh, and that is adding one totally new dimension to, to our job uh, this is some quote, uh, uh, let's say, from the um, World Quality Report, the latest one, the recent one, which is showing us how the tendencies are going higher uh, in the uh, combinations with uh, artificial intelligence and automation themselves. Uh, and I think in the future it's going to get even, even uh, better. Uh, now, uh, I wouldn't explain this slide because uh, uh, these uh, are kind of uh, situations where you can, uh, with some percentage, uh, see the, the usage all, uh, of all of these, uh, um, these concepts. Uh, still, uh, this is like a silver unicorn, you know, we are not able to try this out and these numbers don't mean to us uh, in that uh, department. Uh, but we can see the trends. And uh, that uh, uh, itself is important enough for us to uh, to decide what to do in the future. Uh, now uh, let's uh, uh, go a little bit through the couple of scenarios uh, uh, how we can actually use the AI to improve our automation testing. Uh, first, uh, let's say the line of defense here is the data line. Uh, because the data uh, is uh, the mm, kind of core structure of uh, each test uh, and uh, it uh, must not uh, be corrupted for our tests to be, um, uh, to be uh, valuable. Uh, so, uh, in these cases, uh, let's uh, now look at the traditional models. Uh, the companies were always obsessed with data, you know, tried to get them as much as they could, but without AI, um, uh, they could only get uh, pretty much minimal uh, revenue. Now, the new approach here uh, is uh, to uh, kind of use the AI, you know, as you can see here, uh, and the larger scale uh, of uh, cultivating it and getting the maximum revenue uh, of it uh, by for example, making it the most uh, optimal way. Uh, that uh, I'm a little bit out of time, so I will go through all of this uh, a little bit much faster. We will have the presentations uh, um, attached, and also I will give you my email so you can ask me your questions later. Uh, so let's go now through all of this a little bit faster. So here we have the scenarios uh, about the classified automation testing results. You know, this uh, sounds now familiar with the class uh, classification and clustering. Uh, the next one uh, is a, a very interesting way to um, kind of uh, uh, use the Jenkins uh, to optimize uh, the Jenkins runs. Uh, the people who are working on large pro uh, projects will understand this uh, because uh, by adding uh, the, um, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence here can optimize our efficiency to uh, a very, very large scale and our cost-effective uh, process will uh, increase very, very much. Uh, Okay, uh, this one is the uh, example I prepared, but now I will just take a couple of short notices about it. So, the uh, situation is when you're having an element on the web page, uh, and this element uh, needs to be targeted, you know, uh, but uh, someone kind of changed that page. So, in the regular, without AI uh, uh, environment, you would, not, you would not be able to do this. You would have to change the locators to search for a bug and so on, uh, and afterwards uh, you get, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintenance which is doing all and all over again, um, and this is something uh, which is very, very expensive. Uh, but with the usage of the AI, uh, you can actually implement a mechanism which would try to find the button itself even if the locator is different now. So, uh, therefore, uh, you can just create a model 
uh, which could have an actions, for example, uh, move the mouse for a couple of pixels, or uh, let's say scroll the mouse, uh, or maybe uh, try to, to go up and down. Uh, and eventually, um, you uh, for each of your actions, you are uh, expecting the reward, which can be, for example, you, you are able to change. Uh, your your role can change if you are let's say clicking on the button that you are looking for or uh, uh, interacting with some other element. Uh, but in uh, that uh, uh, in uh, that um, uh, term of events, uh, you actually succeeded to uh, influence your tests without yourself doing it. A uh, AI did it for you. You know, it uh, discovered that the issue uh, is not a bug; that it's just uh, related to the refactoring of the page. And you don't have to waste time uh, to uh, fix things uh, and to change it. Your tests become much less flaky, and that is uh, very, very important. Uh, here you can see, uh, let's say, some kind of uh, pseudo codes, um, which you can uh, look uh, at uh, later. I'm not sure how many people here know Python. Uh, I kind of divided this to the actions, to the test mode, to the training mode. We can easily relate this to the previous uh, things that I, that I wrote. Uh, all of these actions are kind of familiar. You, you will understand them. They're self self-explanatory. Uh, now, uh, let's say and finish all of this by two things. Uh, first one, uh, will the AI replace us eventually? Uh, the answer is maybe. <laughs> we can never be sure. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even the horse population, you know, at the kind of uh, beginning of this century was pretty large, but then the car came, and now you can count them on the fingers. Uh, so we are not cer certain if our job is going to be popular then. Uh, but we can find other jobs, and those jobs can be related with all of these knowledges that we are uh, now uh, trying to get. And mostly all of them are related with the AI. Uh, depending on that, and this is basically the most important thing, because so so sooner or later we are going to kind of uh, have to work with the AI, whether we want that or not. Uh, we are all going to have to feed some data in some bit at some point. Uh, the main problem here is ethics, and that is the key part from my point of view, because many people actually do not uh, consider it as an important thing, and it is uh, the most important thing. If you feed your models uh, with the false data, with the corrupted data, if you are giving it uh, uh, a state where, uh, let's say, to learn from something bad, uh, you can think of AI as a mirror, uh, which would uh, turn out to be bad itself. And therefore, there are all those fears which are coming out that uh, the Terminator um, and Skynet uh, scenarios, when we actually will have the robot murderers or something like that. Um, even if we do, it's going to be because of us, <laughs> because of the things that they learned from us, not because they are that by the default. Uh, so, uh, as advice to all of us who are just going to try uh, and go into the AI world, uh, your ethical principles must be very, very uh, great and uh, top notch. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, send me the, the, Q, uh, the your questions uh, at this mail. I will just share that with you. And if at least any one of you uh, decided to go to the side of machine learning and AI, I am really happy because of that. Do not be afraid of it, uh, just try to understand it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So if someone missed the lecture, uh, all of them will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you missed the Q&A session or just want to give us some feedback, drop us an email at hr at It was a nice get together and I believe it was useful for, uh, to you. Um, after such a great response from people, I think that we will organize the next one again in the near future. 
So thank you for being a part of the International Quantux Meetup. We have some job position on our website, so please feel free to check them and apply. We are eager to meet you. Bye and have a nice